to human species, human nature, or society, and I'll be talking about how misanthropy is rampant, not only in the animal rights community, as uh, we can see by things people have posted on Facebook and things that people will say. Some people are quite open about it. I think I'm quite open about it. And, uh, and also we see uh, lots of misanthropy and other social justice movements as well. It's uh, kind of an undercurrent in any movement that is dissatisfied with the state of things as, as they are. And, and I'm, going, I'm going to examine, th examine that. Yeah, I, put the, I put the quote here from Zizek. Humanity is okay, but 99% of people are boring idiots. And on bad days, I think that that statement is problematic because he says humanity is okay in the first, in the first part. Uh, and so I'll be talking about hypothetical scenarios in which uh, animal rights activists and uh, radical environmentalists have talked about uh, the possibility of eliminating humanity and the consequences of that, but be aware I will be talking about that purely as a thought experiment. I do not mean that literally in any way. It's not a plan. It's, not, <laughs> it's, a it's plan. not a plan that we have. No. So, you know, the police don't have to be uh, alarmed by that. No, 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 no one has it's a, to be. It's a philosophical alarmed. thought experiment, right? Yeah. Yeah, the, the images on the first slide, uh, that's Hannibal, and he's saying, save the animals, eat people, and uh, the woman with the chainsaw, animal abusers, come out, come out wherever you are, I like that one. And also there's, a, there's a, a tension that exists within us regarding misanthropy and vegan humanism. It's not like we're 100% for one or the other. No. There, we but, but there is a, but there is a, dis, there is a, a one, distinguish, one distinguishment to be made because because uh, animal rights activists and social justice activists who tend to be tend to be more idealistic will tend to uh, will tend to be less misanthropic because they'll see human interests as holding value as well. Whereas if you see human interests as having no value or, or as a negative value, and you do do cost benefit analysis, and you think that the good of the vast majority of species ultimately overpowers the good for one species, then then obviously the, the animals went out and it may be best after all to eliminate humanity. Well that's the utilitarian Which is a utilitarian view. I tend yeah. I tend to vacillate between both of those. So you vacillate between the utilitarian and deontological views uh, on that? Mostly the, the deontological view I stick to to, to be safe, but uh, I do think that in a worst case scenario it does sound very appealing to eliminate uh, the one pest to save the rest of biodiversity. <laughs> so it, that's the, the extreme misanthropy is the view in the context of climate change is that humanity is expendable for the sake of saving biodiversity. Exactly. And I will talk about the history of that as I go on. And here I've included a quote that I really like from the biologist E.O. Wilson. He says, the pattern of human population growth in the 20th century was more bacterial than primate. And I particularly like the image of uh, the xenomorph from the Alien series and uh, a man. And it says, this creature threatens to destroy life on Earth. The other one is an alien because in the Aliens movies, the alien is supposed to be the most horrifying parasite that anyone can conceive of that it can conceive of that uh, takes over the bodies of other creatures and turns them into itself and uh, and reproduces in the most grotesque way uh, very frequently and like just takes over other areas and uh, we don't see that there is something of ourselves in that and, uh, there's a funny meme humans are parasites to earth and diseases are the earth's immune system he's had a sudden realization and uh, this sentiment is expressed very well in this uh, sequence from The Matrix, which I will show. I'd like to share a revelation that I've had during my time here. It came to me when I tried to classify your species. I realized that you're not actually mammals. Every mammal on this planet 
instinctively develops a natural equilibrium with the surrounding environment, but you humans do not. You move to an area and you multiply and multiply until every natural resource is consumed. And the only way you can survive is to spread to another area. There is another organism on this planet that follows the same pattern. Do you know what it is? A virus. The human beings are a disease, a cancer of this planet. You are a plague, and we are the cure. Ich kam zu einer interessanten Entdeckung, seit ich in der Matrix bin. Es fiel mir auf, als ich versuchte, eure Spezies zu klassifizieren. Ihr seid im eigentlichen Sinne keine richtigen Säugetiere. Jedwede Art von Säuger auf diesem Planeten entwickelt instinktiv ein natürliches Gleichgewicht mit ihrer Umgebung. Ihr Menschen aber tut dies nicht. Ihr zieht in ein bestimmtes Gebiet und vermehrt euch und vermehrt euch, bis alle natürlichen Ressourcen erschöpft sind. Und der einzige Weg zu überleben, ist die Ausbreitung auf ein anderes Gebiet. Es gibt noch einen Organismus auf diesem Planeten, der genauso verfährt. Wissen Sie welcher? Das Virus. Der Mensch ist eine Krankheit. Das Geschwür dieses Planeten, ihr seid wie die Pest. Und wir sind die Heil. So, so that's a sentiment that uh, I think a lot of people, uh, especially in the, the environmental justice and animal justice communities, uh, as we, we think about the effects of climate change and uh, the very severe consequences that can and will happen if we proceed in burning all of the coal and oil and gas, uh, we seem to have set no limit on ourselves and we see a parallel and the imperative to to maximize profit at all costs under global capitalism like just to spread to other areas and drain them of resources for for the sake of of the market it's another way in which we're acting in a very parasitic way and uh, so is it capitalism that's for the problem or is it um is it in more intrinsically human nature, or is it just the economic system? It's both, but the eco economic system, the, the economic system is parasitic as well, and it kind of drives that home, because if we were able to put a limit on growth, then, then we would be creating more of an equilibrium, but, but the, way it, the way it is now, with just endless colonization, and endless growth, it mirrors the, the reproduction of a parasite. Well, what I mean is um, there's, a, there's a sort of a primitivism uh, philosophy that, that indigenous people, for example, who live in harmony with nature are not uh, inherently problematic, um, is in, and only industrial man is. Or you can look at it like um, there were um, there were early natives to, or indigenous people, not indigenous, but aboriginal people in North America who, 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 when they came here, exterminated um, all the great mammals. Well, if you look at what happened on Easter Island. Right. So there are examples where... I, I think there are examples. Like, I think yeah. there are, I think we are, intri we, I think there are examples like that. We are intrinsically greedy on some level. Like, you can be an Augustinian Lutheran about it and say that, we have an inner disposition towards evil, but I, I would be wary of of pinning all ills on that instead of looking at the structural violence that happens as well as some people would do. What I guess I'm getting at is is, is it a is, is is ultimately the view here a Hobbesian view that life is mean, short, nasty, and brutish, British. or is it a Rousseauian view that 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 humanity ultimately has dignity and it just needs to be liberated from oppressive structures? I think both are true on some level, but but obviously the latter is a is a far more idealistic view. Whereas 
Well, it's the view that's pre that the Enlightenment is predicated on. Exactly. And, and what human rights are predicated on. Right. But. Um, Whereas the, the Hobbesian view is is uh, one that one, one that I think would go further towards justifying those kinds of utilitarian situate uh, solutions. It definitely justifies, or Hobbes used it to justify a hierarchical. Uh, yeah, and, and of also society. like the, the oppression right. of of certain groups of people and uh, right. the limiting of of freedom. Well, it, it, it dovetails with the whole idea of uh, enlightened self-interest, which is capitalism is based on that. Exactly. And here's a, another one on the humans are cancer theme that I thought was funny. This tomb is open tonight. It's crowded. There's too many of us. You can't have too many. Growth is good. In fact, unrestrained growth is the philosophy of the cancer cell. But we're using up resources that other cells need. Other cells? Like spleen cells? You value spleen cells over cancer cells? No! Other I... cells wouldn't have any value without cancer cells around to appreciate. But what about... Cancer cells are the pinnacle of evolution. We're not like other cells. We can think. We're more successful because we're smarter. You know, sometimes hey, I... Hey, the show's starting. Good evening, ladies and James. Especially James. <laughs> I just metastasize in from the liver. And boy, is my cytoplasm tired! <laughs> this guy. This guy is the pinnacle of evolution. <laughs> Looks like you're expecting two! Oh yes, I just love children! How many now? 537? Oop, make that 538! We're stopping at 2000! For the environment! How ecological! Well, like ZPT says, consider having none or one! And be sure to stop at 2000! But you don't plan, children! They just happen! <laughs> it sure seems that way! What do you mean, not reproduce? How many billion more cancer cells do we need? If smart cancer cells like us don't reproduce, then we'll only have dumb cancer cells. Things will just get worse. But the body can't handle this many of us. Of course it can. Cancer cells are just as natural as any other cells. We're part of the body. Why would the body make cells that were bad for it? Maybe we should metastasize out to the country. I hear the lymph nodes are nice. Not the suburbs, the country. Like where we went camping last year? Yeah, the, the left, left lung. lung. You need to get out more. Get out where? It's like this everywhere. Listen to him. He lives in a tumor and he thinks the whole body is overpopulated. It so happens that the body's entire cancer population could fit into just one nostril. That leaves a whole other nostril free. Metastasis is our natural biological function, our manifest destiny, if you will. It's survival of the fittest. It's a family tradition for me. My great-great-grandfather fed our living tissue. When this host is consumed, we'll find another one. Or its economic equivalent. You know, sometimes I think all the cells in the body form one big organism, and that organism has a soul, and it can feel what we're doing to it. You and your crackpot new age theories.
So that's the same person, Nina Paley, who did yes, the stork is the yes, bird of war. The stork is the bird of war. That's, they're both really. Uh, and mis- also, this meant land is my land. She did that one. It's very she mis- has a lot of great ones. Very misanthropic, yeah. Wow. <laughs> And she's the designer of the Voluntary Human Extinction website. Oh, is she? No, really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Seriously? She really doesn't like us, but I can't disagree. Mm. But we have to provide a balanced lecture. Yeah. Uh, well, you do that presentation. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah, as I, as I just mentioned, the, the Voluntary Human Extinction uh, movement and and also, <laughs> the children of men scenario, which even though it would be it would be incredibly disturbing for any humans alive, it would be a relief for all of the non-human animals. Uh, if you're very misanthropic, you would think it unfortunate that uh, the baby is born at the end of the film. And uh, there's this honor, oh lord, keep, please, please keep all the stupid people from breeding. We're getting badly outnumbered down here. That's from Facebook. It's another example of the misanthropy of the animal rights community. Mm-hmm. And uh, backing that up, I have a quote from Schopenhauer, who was extremely, extremely misanthropic. And he says that the act of procreation were neither the outcome of a desire nor accompanied by feelings of pleasure, but a matter to be considered on, decided on the basis of purely rational considerations. Is it likely the human race would still exist? And he thinks no. No is another uh, movie that explores this, you know, the, the issue of whether humans should exist or not. Yeah, yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, that's, a, that's, another, that's another example. I, I will get to that in a minute. Yeah, Jean-Paul Sartre, his play, uh, No Exit, hell, hell is Other People, like the idea that we are we are the cause of, and the fact for Sartre the the fact that we were always doomed to see each other through, to see ourselves through the eyes of other people, is the cause of, of all of our, our misery. And his play is an attempt to demonstrate that. I don't hate people. I just feel better when they aren't around. Charles Bukowski and the, the Grumpy Cat. One I love that. Is it wrong that I care more about what happens to animals than what happens to people? A lot of animal rights activists have that sentiment. It's hard for us to feel sorry for our fellow members of our fellow members of our species when we see all of the, the suffering that we cause. Uh, so I made a tex- taxonomy of different kinds of mis- mis- misanthropy. And I'll start by talking about the roots of misanthropy in religion. In views of human nature as inherently tainted and the destruction of the overwhelming majority of human beings by God as a good thing. And as Paul just mentioned, uh, the movie Noah, the idea of original sin, the, the idea that uh, from the beginning there was something so so foul in us that makes us un- unworthy of of anything, anything good. Uh, so in Christian theology, God offers salvation to us, but it's something that we are wholly undeserving of. Uh, also, with in, in certain forms of Protestantism, Protestantism the idea of predestination, the, the idea that uh, you're doomed from the beginning to go to heaven or to go to hell, and there's uh, nothing that you can do during your life to change that. Uh, it's a very deterministic view. And then, uh, thanks to evangelical Christians, we have the rapture, the idea that uh, in fundamentalist sex, the, the vast majority of human beings are going to be obliterated by God, except for, and the only exception will be the fundamentalist Christians. So that's an example of the vast majority of humanity being seen as totally expendable. It's kind of a utilitarian view. It's, it's not a, a system of moral consideration that can be, it's not an ethics that can be expanded to all of humanity, or to all of uh, animality as well. It, it's an ethics that only applies to a very select group of people, and that, that makes it different from human rights or, or animal rights. Uh, you could say God is the ultimate misanthrope. And, and I, I'd also like to mention eugenics, which seems to be, the more I think about it, almost a pseudoscientific take on predestination, where it's not due to uh, original sin, uh, 
it's not to, to the corrupted state of the human soul, but the corrupted state of one's body, some uh, genetic failure that makes you doomed, damned from the start, and then there's nothing that you can do to save, to save yourself. Uh, so you can't even convert to Christianity, or uh, there's nothing, there's no action that you can take. Uh, it's another form of misanthropy, the idea that the vast majority of human beings should be should be eliminated, or at least a good chunk of them. And so thirdly, misanthropy and social justice movements. Uh, and it, it doesn't this isn't necessarily talking about animal rights activists, because the the cruelty of human beings towards other human beings is often seen as a cause for disillusionment with the human race. And uh, for example, uh, certain anti-racist activists, they'll hate uh, humans of the industrialized West, but not indigenous people. And, but however, the abuse and murder of non-human animals, which happens on such a larger scale, is completely ignored. It really speaks to how... I, I also think that social justice activists tend to develop this view because we're often seen as killjoys in, in a lot of spaces that we go to in life. Uh, feminists, for example, are often seen as seen as killjoys by bringing up systematic oppression of women and and, and uh, vegans are often seen as killjoys as well for for being seen as criticizing the things that other people are are eating for criticizing the way other people perceive it as normal to live their lives and and, the thir and fourthly, uh, radical environmental movements, for example, the Earth First movement. Uh, and, and this is where a, a good distinction between the utilitarian view and the deontological view is made, because, because uh, these movements tend to privilege ecosystems as a whole over the individual animals or individual human beings in them. Uh, human beings are part of the environment, even though uh, in these incredibly misanthropic worldviews, uh, they tend to exclude human beings from the environment, and maybe there are good reasons that we should be excluded from the environment and the earth would heal, but we are still part of it. Isn't there a distinction between uh, social ecology and deep ecology? Yeah, yeah, um, because the, the deep ecology view tends to privilege the ecosystem as a whole over over individual animals in it. So, so for example, that would legitimize uh, the killing of certain animals that are overpopulated to to save the for the good of the ecosystem as, as a whole and considering that there are seven billion of us and there will be ten billion of us, of us soon you could exploit you could extend the same logic to human beings as well that's the issue of environmental fascism environmental fascism uh, with that's Tom Reagan's concept I I plan on getting to that as well. So, so under this framework, desiring the extinction of the human species makes a lot of sense. If you take that utilitarian view in which, uh, in which uh, an even an evil means is okay if it leads to an ultimately good end, uh, the climate scientist James Hansen predicts that if we succeed in burning all of the fossil fuels, it could be the end of the life systems of Earth. And when we take a consequence so dire into cons consideration, uh, a utilitarian would, s would say that maybe it's better if uh, something kills us off and all of that suffering is spared for the rest of the Earth's organisms. And even though it wouldn't be good for us, it would suck a lot for us, but uh, the vast majority of beings uh, would not suffer. So it seems like a sacrifice that, that should be made, but uh, if, you're, if you believe in human rights, if you believe in animal rights, which would include humans, then, then uh, that's not a good solution because it's a massive violation of the rights of human animals. So a bioterrorist who, say, breeds breeds a disease that could wipe us all out and release it, they would be in the wrong. Even though a strict utilitarian might see that as a good thing. Yeah, and, and I also wanted to mention misanthropy on a more species-specific basis, because I find that on the internet I often come across really disturbingly angry and violent comments from, from individuals uh, reacting to stories about, say, cat and dog abusers. But uh, but uh, my guess is that 
most of these people are probably aren't vegan and they don't take issue with the eating of cows, pigs, chickens. They don't see that as, as wrong. However, is it, could misanthropy be another form of speciesism because you're speciesist against humans? Right. <laughs> and if you believe that all animals have rights, then human rights should be taken into consideration as well. Mm -hmm. I guess that would mean, that would uh, entail the view that not all humans are oppressors as well. Yes. Which is true, not all are, but more, many are. Uh, yeah, so, and sometimes that's, that becomes extremely uncomfortably blurry. Yeah, yeah sometimes it, it like, becomes... Like vegans, are they oppressors? I mean, we're using up resources, are, but are we oppressive to the extent a that... A vegan who drives a car. True, that's me. A vegan who flies. <laughs> Al Gore does that. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So he's burning fossil fuels even though he's a climate activist. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it, it's, it's very difficult because structural violence is everywhere. And, uh, and I, I find that some people, like, you might get into an argument with, they'll, they'll be extremely cynical and they say, well, well, we live in a, a social and economic order that makes it impossible to do pretty much anything without oppressing someone in some way, then why do anything? And that's an example of, they, they would call that the, the nirvana fallacy. It's where you pit uh, one instance against another instance that is just so completely angelic and unrealistic and perfect that whatever you do in comparison looks bad. Mm -hmm. Uh, David Stiebel calls that the problem of perfectionism. Mm -hmm, yeah, exactly, and, and I come across that a lot in arguing with omnivores. They, where they'll point out that we live in a consumer society in which even if you are vegan, any number of everyday activities you perform oppress someone else that will cause suffering for, for someone else. So then. Why do anything? It's just a, a way for people to totally evade responsibility. So it's perfectionism versus the uh, sort of a, a pragmatic veganism, which is about re reducing harm as much as possible. Harm reduction. Harm reduction, yeah. But in a way that is a that is a utilitarian I idea see. as well. I suppose, or it's more it's more pragmatism, wouldn't it be? Yeah. Or situation S ethics. Situational ethics, I was just yeah. about to say that. Mm -hmm. This is from the Voluntary <laughs> Human Extinction Movement <coughs> website. The Eco Death Gouge. How deep is your apology take is sounding? <laughs> so, on good days, I would put myself at the level that says wilderness has a right to exist for its own sake. Uh, I wouldn't say any more or any. Well, wilderness, like that term is problematic because you're kind of lumping the, the non human animals together, but. I think that the humans and the non-human animals have about an equal right to exist on good days, but on bad days, I sympathize with the level that is abysmally deep and says, a quick annihilation is too good for humans. A horrible fatal illness from outer space is only fair. What does the top one say? The top one is, we should take good care of our planet as we would any valuable tool. So it's that that's the, the level of instrumental logic, which... Uh, human superiorism. Human superiorism. Superiorism, that's what the vast majority of human beings are on. A bit deeper, we have a responsibility to protect Earth's resources from our future generation, for our future generations. And uh, that that's a, a bit deeper than seeing the environment purely as a tool and seeing the animals purely as tools, but it's still saying that we ought to preserve the environment for the sake of humans and not for the sake of other, other organisms. Like, for example, some conservative Christians. I'd say most environmentalists are at shallow, the shallow level, which is uh, protect level. future generations. They haven't moved to the uh, idea of the intrinsic value of the Earth itself or the inhabitants of the Earth, right? Yeah. And would you say that? I mean, I would say that's where most of the environment is. Yeah, yeah I, would, I would agree. Where it's, uh, their concern with the environment is explicitly centered around humans in some cases, or in other cases where the non-human animals tend to be lumped together, and uh, the, the value of preserving the, the ecosystem for, for those animals isn't, isn't really thought about. 
or is only thought about on a very superficial level. Yeah, and this is uh, Noah's flaw, as we were talking about a few minutes ago. Uh, God is the ultimate misanthrope. He drowned most of humanity and saved the animals. The story of Noah is written in the Jewish apocalyptic tradition, which condemns humanity's wickedness and envisages a rebirth for the for a new world through the destruction of the old. The misanthropic version of animal rights philosophy shares Yahweh's version vision to be rid of humanity and to make room for animal kind. However, he did kill most of the animals as well. <laughs> so right. it is more of an eco-fascist view that God takes, and and he he is only saving a select few, and thinks that the vast majority should be destroyed. And also, uh, there is a split being made between the environments, the environment and humans as well. Like it wouldn't fit if you do view humans as part of the environment. Are you getting to apocalyptic uh, misanthropy? Yeah, that's an example of the apocalyptic misanthropy that is in a lot of religious traditions. Mm -hmm. Christianity is incredibly misanthropic. In a way it is, isn't it? With the idea of original sin and, yeah. and Armageddon and the yeah, and yeah, apocalypse. Yeah, the, the, the idea that there's something so foul in human nature that, that uh, we're that we're so undeserving of anything from God, and that uh, it's justified for God to kill the vast majority of us. <laughs> or that's in the Jewish tradition, but yeah. But, but it is also in the New Testament in Revelation. It is, it is in the New Testament as well. Right. It's yeah. True. And uh, Feuerbach, for example, would explain that by saying that uh, everything that is good in us is projected onto God so that the human being is left feeling empty and feeling like a valueless sinner because there's nothing there. It's a, it's a quite negative view of religion. And there's no value put on animals either in that vision. Uh, because if everything is, if God is all valuable, at the, it's also at the expense of the earth and the animal and yes. the habits, right? They're yeah. viewed as lesser than in that hierarchical mm -hmm. framework. It's true, it's good observation. Yeah, yeah, he did kill most of the animals as well. Oh, right. And he only saved a, a few of them, which shows a disregard for the lives of the animals. And, uh, I also have a picture of a t-shirt uh, that suggests killing hunters, and that's another phenomenon that I thought needed to be addressed, uh, where we, on sometimes on Facebook and another uh, social media, we we see people in the animal rights community advocating physical violence against uh, against hunters, against farmers, uh, in the sectors, people involved in the animal industrial complex, and uh, and often they'll they'll say that it's justified because it, it, it's justified because uh, the people don't have a conscience. It's impossible to compromise with them, and that. Uh, and they, they look at all the animal suffering that is at stake. I added an image of a demonstration that was held at, outside of the house of, of the sector. And uh, I, I don't agree with that at all because I think that's incredibly violent and it's a violation of that person's privacy. Uh, but uh, some would argue that that is, totally, that is totally justified because of the severity of the situation. And... Yeah, and uh, I find Carol Adams' analysis of this very interesting, especially with regards to the Kill Hunter shirt, because uh, she would say, she would uh, say that uh, meat eating and hunting is an example of a via man subjectivity, where masculinity is defined through through harming others, especially those who are more vulnerable, via animals, women, and and so on, and the idea that uh, showing empathy for the individuals being hurt is as a, as a sign of being feminine and weak, and uh, you can't show emotion and be a man at the same time, and uh, and I find it interesting because it, that's an, this is an example in which uh, the animal rights movement is becoming patriarchal, at least in that situation, and uh, that critique can apply to the animal rights movement in some instances as well, and that's another. Way of, way of distinguishing between the utilitarian worldview and the deontological 
worldview because someone who advocates for for a violent uprising would say that it's necessary because clearly the people in charge, uh, the bourgeoisie, they don't have a conscience. Uh, there's no way of compromising with them. Uh, therefore, we should kill them. Whereas uh, an extreme pacifist and uh, Anita, Anita was was talking about this. Uh, she 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 brought up the point that it's impossible to do something positive for other people if you don't love them. You can't do something positive for someone if if you don't if you don't love them on, on some level. And and also uh, what uh, and also a pacifist tries to appeal to the conscience of of the people who are who are causing suffering, mm -hmm. recognizing that that everyone has a has a conscience that that can be appealed appealed to. Isn't that the that's the fun, that seems to me to be one of the fundamental differences here between vegan humanism and misanthropy? Is yes. that misanthropy views humans as incorrigibly bad and and All not foul. Well, you might as well drown them. There, there's no <laughs> re, them. there's no chance for redemption. Whereas vegan humanism views humanity as salvageable or uh, redeemable. Redeemable, right? Yeah. Exactly. Savable. Yeah. It's a comparison you can make with different Christian theologies. It doesn't view humans as inherently bad somehow, even even though they do bad things, right? Yeah, that the, there isn't it, it views it sees an inherent goodness in, in humanity as well as manifested in the fact that we all have a conscience. Uh -huh. Yeah, and uh, I think most animal rights activists are torn between those. Many are torn between those two views. Although some veer more towards one, and some veer more towards another, you have a whole spectrum. Yeah, here are a few more graphics. Uh, the human extinction button. Uh, you push it and humans go extinct, and it has a switch going from fast to slow, depending on how quickly you want it to happen. <laughs> this is something I found on Facebook. It's simultaneously an expression of misanthropy, and it's a critique of a happy meat solution. Reasons for eating human meat. Uh, my favorite is is number six. They live full happy lives in offices and malls till they are slaughtered humanely. That's a satire, of course. It's, it's, a, it's a satire, it's not of a, course. It's not a prescription. It's, no. it's not a prescription. <laughs> <laughs> it's from the, the page Cardis Say the Darndest Things. And uh, it's obviously making fun of uh, reasons that humans give for, for eating meat and, and also for for uh, murdering certain <laughs> animals. And I find that one very interesting because uh, some carnists will say things like, "Oh no, it's okay as long as you don't waste the animal's body. It's fine as long as you use everything. Look at Native Americans. But I don't know. Uh, of course I'm saying this sarcastically, and I don't mean this in any way literally, but, <laughs> but what if Hitler hadn't wasted the people he killed and he had eaten them? <laughs> And number 10, the humans kill each other by the thousands in horrible ways. Every year, millions of humans starve to death, which is more human gas chambers or star starvation. And obviously, that's a, that's a satire of reasons that humans will give for, for killing uh, animals that are thought to be overpopulated deer, for example, because, uh, because, because they'll say, oh, but the animals will starve to death if we don't shoot them. Uh, shooting them is obviously more humane, therefore we should do it. But but they also ignore that the reason the the animals are overpopulated is because uh, we've ruined their habitat. Like we've killed killed all the wolves, for example. We've killed their natural predators. So so of course they are overpopulated, and uh, we neglect to see our own role in that. And if you apply that utilitarian logic to our own role in this situation, maybe you would say that that it would be better to, to kill us off. And uh, considering that food, I mean, of course, I mean this completely wrong, uh, <laughs> completely sarcastically, but considering that food shortages will be worse and, and there will be in extreme droughts with climate change over the next century, then uh, maybe it would be more humane to exterminate us instead of to let us starve, because <laughs> that's literally what's going to happen. And number two, indigenous people have been eating humans for thousands of years. If your ancestors didn't eat humans, you wouldn't even be here. Uh, it's been well established uh, by 
archaeologists that are very early ancestors ate each other for extra protein. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's also a play on the, the, the meme you'll hear from Carnus saying that um, meat, eating meat was necessary for human evolution. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, there, there but, is... you can, but considering that we did cannibalize each other uh, quite frequently and for a long time, and uh, it's often suspected that we did kill each other for the purpose of cannibalizing each other, uh, Neanderthal remains have been found that suggest that you could say that we evolved due to eating each other. And that might be a scenario that will happen in the future with the apocalyptic climate change. Yeah, unfortunately. Uh, right? You see that in dystopian sci-fi movies. Yeah. Soiling <coughs> green. <laughs> Soiling green, right. Or, yeah. Uh... yeah, that's the like number four. Why don't you tell tigers, sharks, and alligators to stop eating people too? It's called the food chain for a reason. Because we, we fancy that we're at the top of the food chain, but but really compared to so many other animals, we are a lot more frail than them. And uh, there was a paper recently that I heard about that said that our level on the food chain is actually most similar to pigs and sardines, so we are not anywhere near the top of it. <laughs> yeah, anyways. Yeah. Oh, Bizarro getting it right. And now I'd like each of you to tell me what you would, would have liked to be when you, grew, when you grew up had your predecessors not doomed you to a catastrophic wasteland. <laughs> yeah, so... So in the previous slides, I went over the button thought experiment, and if we take that view seriously, then that causes the, the villain who wants to exterminate humanity to appear like a noble character rather than as an evil one. However, there's, uh, this is extremely questionable because, uh, because we talked about the mass death that will unfortunately likely occur over the 20th century, uh, 21st century due to climate change. And we can ex expect the same with respect to non-human animals if we look at how they've been treated, especially farmed animals during uh, the foot and mouth disease epidemic, uh, bird flu. Uh, it gets very ugly in pandemic situations and that will only increase over the 20 21st century as tropical diseases move north because temperatures become more hospitable to them. Uh, yeah, so, and that will all happen with the good of the ecosystem and the health of the population as a whole as a justification. So that's also another risk when we're applying utilitarian solutions, and that is an example of what the animal rights philosopher Tom Regan would call eco-fascism, the, the privilege, privileging of the environment as a whole over individuals and uh, forgetting about the individuals who make up the environment and he accused Aldo Leopold of that with the land ethic in in which and also uh, deep ecology could be accused of that because in, in both those uh, philosophies uh, what's seen as good is what is good for the ecosystem as a whole and not for individuals and uh, yeah I'm now I'd like to ask if misanthropy in the movement is necessarily a harmful thing because I think that I, I do think that it is a harmless expression in many in many situations of frustration from uh, people who normally wouldn't be in favor of violent solutions, and it's also I also believe it's a way for us to cope with the injustice that we see on a regular on a regular basis. Uh, where innocent individuals are often punished and uh, the guilty ones are never brought to justice. Uh, I think I think also we see this in, in religious worldviews a lot as well, like the idea of uh, certain people being condemned and others being being saved, and even people who are guilty of various crimes who go unpunished in the present world will be punished in, in the next life, so they always better would better watch out. Uh, <coughs> It's a desire for, for justice in an unjust world, and that ties into Marx's critique of religion, because he said that the function of religion was to provide us with a sense of, of justice in a world that is fundamentally unjust, in which uh, the vast majority of human beings are oppressed by a select few, and life is extremely difficult. And However, another, on the other side, an argument could be made that misanthropy doesn't have a place in the movement because it contributes nothing of value, uh, which these sentiments gen gen generally don't. And uh, Anita was saying yesterday that expressions of misanthropy are always signs of an underlying hatred of others or an underlying neurosis. But 
But I wonder if it could just be a way of letting off steam. And I, I guess if you look at it that way, it could be productive in a sense. <coughs> also, there's the consideration that it could make the movement look bad. And uh, I have the hardest part of being vegan. And uh, the largest part of the pie is dealing with idiots. And often we go through life feeling like this. And misanthropy functions as an outlet for that. <laughs> Time misanthropy is a, is a true expression of emotion. So if we repress it, um, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm against repressing emotions. I personally, I think there's a good in a, in expressing things. Yeah. Uh, there's a risk in repression. The, yeah, the, there's the, a risk in uncontrolled and uncontrolled. exactly. Yeah, because yeah, because it, it, as Freud would say, uh, anything that's repressed comes out and demonically later on in some yeah. uglier way. There were there were truths that were repressed. Uh, often we're well, we're often repressing our our rage against humanity um, and what humans have done, and then that comes out in these extreme expressions on the internet through through a few people. But then other, it, the, but in expressions on the internet, are nothing. The worst expressions of it are terrorism, right? yeah. violence, actual violence against other human beings. Like that actually is a real and serious thing. But, but the internet's really conducive yeah. to that because it's entirely anonymous and people people hide behind that and uh, everything that's repressed comes out because people know there's no repercussions for it. Sometimes the comments are not specific to humanity, they're specific to the Chinese. Yeah, um, yeah, I often come across there's that. There's a tendency of a racist, uh, a racist element in the comments. Um, yeah, because I, I, I was uh, looking at someone's post on Facebook today and uh, yeah, and I think, yeah, yeah, someone posted something that was e extremely racist. Like, I, I don't know if they were vegan, I don't know if they were pro-animal rights, but they, they were, they said that, like, they said something to the point of, like, that the, the Chinese don't have any feelings for animals and they, they should all be killed, and uh, it was just really, really unsettling, is this, to put it lightly. Isn't, isn't this misanthropic feel uh, more associated with uh, recent vegans, like as, as we go through three stages, you know, yeah. as coming from a carnist uh, standpoint, we, yeah. we move into vegetarianism and you go into veganism and you realize all those, yeah. those bad things happening to animals and you feel so, there's there so much be, there uh, rage of... that you just want to, exactly. you, you don't think anything positive. So yeah. it, it, as you evolve, you can kind of get more into the, the uh, yeah. what is it called, that's the veganism. Good, that's a really good point, Carlos. Carlos was saying, I'm just repeating it for the mm -hmm. podcast, saying that uh, that this misanthropic misanthropic rage is, is characteristic of new vegans or animal rights people, whereas if you become more seasoned in it you and have more experience, you become more balanced in your views, right? Yes, yeah, exactly. it, so it's often an expression of extreme frustration and rage at the beginning. And then you learn to deal with yeah, those emotions. All of us, or most of us, go through that rage stage. Yeah, it's called. So exactly. It's, it's, like it's, it's the stages of grief, essentially. Mm -hmm. no, we heard yeah. it described as the stages of grief. Yeah, coming. Animal rights is a is is waking up to a world that will cause extreme stress and grief and anger, uh, but then ultimately, hopefully, as well. Um, it can be transmuted into positive actions. And another way you can think about it is that uh, uh, and are, are constantly forced to repress uh, any, any kind of uh, natural anguish or, or grief or concern that comes out of uh, the processes of uh, killing and eating animals, of seeing them as, as food, of seeing them as uh, instruments to be used by humans. And uh, when they switch to veganism, then that all comes flooding back, and uh, they can't repress that anymore, and and that all has to has to come out in certain ways, and it can come out in quite ugly ways. Paul was saying, um, you were saying that the thinking about animal rights causes emotional stress, and uh, and you have to stop thinking about it after a while, or you become ill. So well, I mean, there, there I think there are times when when uh, I was at a luncheon today, for instance, that was a, a Christmas church staff lunch and everybody was praying for peace and justice over their dead animal meal and, and I didn't eat anything. I ate, I, I, I ate nothing of that meal. I sat down with a glass of wine and I didn't say anything. I, I, people asked me, are you going to eat? I said, no, I'm not going to eat. But I, I, ended up, I ended up feeling quite ill at the end of it and obviously I, I was repressing something because I was with my work colleagues 
who, who know my opinions about these things. But on a day-to-day -day basis, when you keep, when you feel like you're, you're really not being heard or understood, or not, or, or it, it's just, it just goes whoosh, like that. Then, then that kind of can be a cumulative stress on your on your psyche that that's, that might need some kind of meditative technique that that would somehow help you process that and make it less uh, damaging to yourself. Yeah. So that's a better, probably healthier kind of response than misanthropy. <laughs> so misanthropy could be, be viewed as one response, and then sort of a. I don't know, meditation is another. Well, it's a bit uh, like a pressure cooker. I mean, I, you have to let off steam if it gets too much, to be too much, or else right. you, you, you can have make to yourself sick. You can, I think you can make yourself sick sure. if, you, if you hold it all. And you're not really helping anybody no. by doing that. No, no you're, 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 no. I, I can account that as, as part of my own journey through, through this. Uh, both me and my wife are doing meditation and yoga now. That, I guess, probably has, definitely has to do with the fact that we are so much more involved with animal rights and we see so bad, so many bad, bad things. You have to come up with a mechanism of coping yeah. and rather than just being outraged about it. And it's because you're suffering uh, trauma and stress from yeah. your awareness of these things. Exactly. That's why most people don't want to watch Earthlings or be aware because it does cause stress. Uh, there's another form of uh, therapy I could recommend as well, mm -hmm. activism. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I asked Anita Kreins what was her solution to, you know, we did a lecture a year or two ago on this, and she said, a year ago, and she said, well, my solution for the stress caused by animal awareness is to do more activism. Yeah. And that's how she deals Good with it, answer. right? <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, activism creates its own stress, but I mean, it does also as a stress reliever, because at least it makes you feel, whether it's true or not, that you've actually done what you could. You, it makes you feel like you're productive in some way. Um, I mean, just holding this event, while it might not change the world, it makes us feel productive that we're part of the discussion about how we could change the world, even if we don't ever manage to do it. Because the intention is there, right? Well, I think in our interactions with people from, on a day-to-day -day basis, we, we do our own activism at different levels as much as we can. And sometimes it's just a matter of making a meal that friends can enjoy who wouldn't otherwise, you know, be aware of it. There's very, yeah, like, yeah. so you're saying making a meal, a vegan meal, which yeah. you're very good at, you're an <laughs> excellent vegan cook, um, is uh, even small acts like this can change the world in a, in a, for the better. I firmly believe that, and that's actually, that is a very, that tends more in the direction of vegan humanism, which is uh, the hopeful vision, you know, that cooking a vegan meal is a hopeful act, right? Does the, the conversation on population control plays any role in this oh, uh, discussion? Yeah. The, there is a whole discussion around population control, over, human overpopulation. We're at 7 billion now, we're going up to 9 to 11 billion by 2050 AD. Complicated topic because um, there's a, when you become more affluent, there are fewer children per capita. Uh, so there's like one or two or three at most in the uh, global north, industrialized world, and then you have, um, and then you have a, like a population boom among, um, among, among more poor people in the world, uh, but, they're, but they're at the same time consuming per capita fewer um, resources and, and emitting fewer emissions than the, than the uh, more affluent people. Um, so often the argument for the argument for uh, population control comes from people who are not cognizant of the per capita emissions. Uh, and so the issue maybe should be, the underlying issue should be, is it population control or should it be um, how much we limit our, our, uh, our, our consumption and emissions? And, um, and then it has, the, it has the other issue of racism as well, because sometimes people argue for population control along ethnographic lines, which can lead to a sort of a racist final solution for humanity. And I've actually talked to a neo-Nazi who had that vision. That was his ideal vision, you know, to exterminate the non-whites and so on. So it can take that direction. In terms of the issue of misanthropy and animal rights, um, the, uh, you know, the idea of exterminating humanity to make way for, to save non-humanity from, from uh, mass extinction, um, 
is obviously the ultimate expression of population control. And, um, um, but then there are particularly uh, evil ex variations on that that can occur where somebody will say only those that are all Americans should live and everybody else who's not American should die. Or um, everybody who's white should live and everybody who's not white should die. Or anybody who's part of our religion should live and everybody who's not part of, you know, and so on. So it leads to this, uh, what's called parochialism. Um, and uh, sort of a, a collective self-interest according to the in-group or the out-group, uh, as sociologists call it. And um, the, unfortunately, the way the world's going is that it's uh, very often we're going to see we're going to see more and more in this century um, so-called population controls that are <laughs> that are um, based along these along these religious and ethnographic uh, fault lines, uh, leading to genocidal actions against other human beings, which may be you could argue good for animals and the environment, but it's devastating for the human beings themselves. Uh, and, um, and I think that's actually going to happen. Not, it won't be articulated as, oh, we have to get rid of humans to save animals, because the people doing it won't care about the animals either. They'll be doing it to protect their group and because in a world where there are uh, finite resources that are being competed over, like water <coughs> and oil. Mm -hmm. And that's really, um, so the animals ultimately are the loser in all of this in any apocalyptic situation uh, because as humanity gets more and more violent and grows more populous, they're going to be, animals are pushed further and further into wilderness, ever shrinking wilderness areas and increasingly depopulated and it's predicted that by 2100, 80% uh, of all species will be extinct. We're losing um, dozens every day, so it's not a it's a it's a fairly bleak scenario for animals and for all life on Earth at this point. Um, that has led some people to this misanthropic vision, because we're obviously the cause of all of it, um, and that would be their their projected solution. Uh, and again, the vegan humanist solution is to transform humanity and to have that and keep working towards that hopeful vision that humanity can change for the better. Um, it's hard to keep that alive, that faith alive, when we see those things, all these things going on around us. Uh, but since none of us wishes to be mass murderers and we don't have the capability any, anyway, uh, it seems like the only thing that we're left with, right? Yeah. Seeing as we're talking about uh, species extinction and human extinction, I wonder if you have any thoughts about uh, de-extinction. We've heard this resurrection biology, the idea that science is close to being able to bring species out of extinction. I don't think that's realistic, is it? Well, uh, there have been several... You mean like cloning them back into existence? Uh, well, cloning and, uh, yes, basically cloning, yeah. Mm -hmm. But and it's a techno fix that has its own... Th there's the thing. I, but but the, the animals' yeah. habitats no longer exist, yeah. so we're oh, no, they they going to live. Right, they become a, a sort of almost artificial species. Yeah. See, the technological fixes are what often is, is put forward as the solution to the climate crisis and also to the animal uh, cruelty, uh, animal suffering issue, uh, and so on, like the zombie chicken or the eco-pig or other... The envirapig. Envirapig, other bizarre uh, manifestations of technological optimism. But these are, um, uh, these are completely unrealistic. They actually represent a very, another faith in technology. Uh, that doesn't have any rational foundation. Like, it's not as though, um, in a, in, in, I think the, the argument against technological optimism is that it's actually what got us into the climate crisis in the first place, because the technologists can never anticipate the, the byproducts of their engineering. And so they create one solution, they create a solution to one problem, and it creates another problem they didn't anticipate. Jurassic Park. Yeah, Jurassic, <laughs> Jurassic, <laughs> Jurassic Park. Uh, Do you know yeah, GMOs, G, um, there's so many examples. Pesticides are an example that was, you know, that was a solution for um, crops that were uh, bugs eating crops, but then it has this toxic effect, it killed all the birds and it's poisoning us. So uh, they never, because it's not, it's not framed within a holistic vision, 
uh, it's it's framed within a Cartesian vision. It um, it, it it doesn't have any. It doesn't anticipate the negative uh, um, results. The externalities. Uh, the the corporate extern externalities. Exactly. Corporate externalities. Great great term. Yeah, used in economics. There's a, another positive thing that's happening on the animal rights front. I'll just give you one more little glimmer of hope <laughs> to hang on to, uh, which is that uh, there's lawyers are making huge strides in terms of winning the case for legal rights for animals, the non-human rights project. Um, and so they're using chimpanzees and cetaceans like dolphins to argue that uh, because they have intelligence, sentience, language, um, self-awareness, and all these capacities really to the equivalent of, a, say, a young human child in, in these two cases, chimpanzees and uh, cetaceans, that they should be afforded the same legal rights as, as uh, humans. The only argument that has come out against that, really, is that, um, well, you would have to change, too many human industries rely upon this, but it's just really a bad argument because it's really the same as saying the equivalent of saying, well, human, and they did say this when human slavery was being debated in the U.S. in the 1840s. They said, well, we can't get rid of human slavery because the economy would be tanked by it. The society hasn't caught up, according to James Rachels, this philosopher, because we're still, without even knowing it, the inheritors of uh, prejudice from the um, pre-19th century prejudice, uh, or pre-Darwin prejudice, uh, that uh, that it was really pumped into us through Abrahamic religions that humans are separate and above other species. And, uh, and even the uh, Eastern traditions as well, but especially the Abrahamic, had this highly anthropocentric worldview. Um, although it was interesting that you noted the, that they were mis mis they were misanthropy too, but sort of the love-hate relationship with ourselves. But, uh, um, but it, it, it was, so he's claiming that religion is really responsible for this and that our society, although it's been de-religionized in a sense, or secularized, has not caught up with the implication, the moral implications of Darwinism, which show that we are humans, uh, humans are animals of a kind, and, they're, and that we're not higher or lower than other animals. And that's a reality, and that's a fact, because in evolution there is no higher or lower. That's purely uh, something that we project upon it. Uh, on a similar note, like I've often wondered about <coughs> the incredible resistance to, to animal rights comes from, and I, I think that I think that can be located in something similar to uh, to what, what Freud would say he, when he talks about the Copernican revolution and also uh, Darwinism, that uh, these ideas were so resisted because it is a massive challenge to the human ego, to the idea that we are at the center of everything, that we are special. And uh, I, I think that a lot of uh, the negative reactions to animal rights come from the same place as well.